Good morning to everyone. Maybe someone needs to, to tell the people at the back, <laughs> it's time to come in. Um, just to, to, to start this morning, I'm just going to read a scripture, and, and, and uh, this week was reading it, and it's about the good shepherd uh, and his sheep. And Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees about his, his role, his life, and what, uh, and what it, his life would be on earth, that he would, he, he would give up his life for us, but he'd also come back and, and return victorious. So I just want to read here. It says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that I might have life and have it to the full. That they may have life, sorry, that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. I'll just open in prayer. Father, we just ask, Lord, that you bless this church this morning, Father. Lord, we want to invite you to inhabit our praises, Father, as we come and we worship you and we glorify your name, Lord, that our praises will be a sm sweet-smelling offering, Lord, an offering, Lord, of thanksgiving, an offering of adoration, of, of reverence, Lord, because you are worthy of our praises, Father. Lord, we ask, Lord, that, Lord, your word will speak to us, Father. Lord, you know, each of us have come here this morning, Lord, with different needs and desires and burdens, Lord. We want to lay them at, the, at your cross this morning, Father. Lord, that your, Lord, your word will encourage, it will build up, Lord. It will restore and, and, and renew us, Lord, and, and, make us, and strengthen us again, Father. Lord, we just ask, Lord, that all of this in your precious name. Amen. 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 I believe God has made us all musical. It's just that we learn not to be in our society. And uh, I think we should uh, praise him. You know, we, he has given us an instrument. We are so blessed with Philip coming home from, <laughs> from holiday. <laughs> Otherwise, we would never have had anyone. But we have, you all have an instrument. You have your voice. And today, we have the chance to hear you, to sing. <laughs> and it doesn't matter how your voice is. I had a friend once, and he was tone deaf. And he, all, he couldn't hear up or down, so everything was just a straight line, out of tune. But he loved, he loved praising the Lord. And I know that it was a sweet sound to God. Huh? So we have to sing with everything we have. Huh? Let's stand up and sing again. Let everything that has breath. <clears throat> Let everything that, everything that, everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let everything that, everything that, everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise you in the morning, praise you in the evening, praise you when I'm young and when I'm old. Praise you when I'm laughing, praise you when I'm grieving. Praise you every season of the soul. If we could see how much your worth, your power, your might, your endless love, then surely we would never cease to praise. Let everything that, everything that, everything that has breath praise the Lord. Your power, your might, your endless love, then surely they would never cease to praise. Let everything that, everything that, everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let everything that, everything that, everything that has breath praise the Lord. Lord, 
Lord, so we can see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love. As we sing, holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Let me you sing. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. that you are here and we want to see you and I pray that you will open up our hearts so we can really see you. Hallelujah. And let us have the, to praise him with the offering. Hallelujah. Standing here in your presence Thinking of the good things you have done Waiting here patiently Just to hear your still small voice again Holy, righteous, faithful to the end Savior, healer, redeemer for who you are I will worship you for who you are I will worship you for who you are Jesus I will worship you for who you are I will worship you for who you are I will worship you for who you are Jesus Standing here in your presence, thinking of the good things you have done. Waiting here patiently just to hear your still small voice again. Holy, righteous, 
faithful to the end. Savior, healer, redeemer, and friend, I will worship you for who you are. I will worship you for who you are. I will worship you for who you are. Jesus, I will worship you for who you are. I will worship you for who you are. I will worship you for who you are. Jesus. My soul secure. Your promise sure. Your love and joy. Always, always. My Father God, we, we thank you for who you are, Lord. We worship you, Lord, not because of what we can do, what we can bring to you, but we thank you and we worship you because of who you are, a loving God, faithful God, a friend that sticks closer than a brother, the father to the fatherless, our friend, Lord. You have called us your friends. Jesus, we thank you for the sacrifice, your death on the cross. We could never pay back, Lord, for what you've done. But now, Lord God, as we come to worship you, as we've worshipped you, Lord, with our offering, with our tithes, we pray that, God, you bless this giving, Lord. Bless it and use it, Lord, to the extension of your kingdom. To your name's glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning um, and welcome. Are there any first time visitors here this morning? One, two, three, four. Well, welcome very much. We're very glad to have you here. Yeah? Four, oh, five. <laughs> um, really honored to have you here. Please, uh, I'm sure someone would have come around and, and, and asked you to sign up or introduce you to them. Please, there's coffee afterwards. Feel free to come and join us. I would like to meet you and talk to you, and, and really, we, are, we trust that you'll be blessed in the service today. Today, there's no announcements, so it's, so, <laughs> yeah, it's holidays. Everyone's on holiday, no one's working, so nothing to do. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, next is the kids. So can all the kids please come up to the front? We need you right up here. Kids are 12 and below, maybe, or 15 and below. <laughs> come. Come on, hurry. We want to lift up Jesus. 
and lift him high up. We want to see Jesus lifted high, a banner that flies across this land, that all men might see the truth and know He's the way to heaven. Stand up and sing. We want to see Jesus lifted high, a banner that flies across this land, that all men might see the truth and know He's the way to heaven. We want to see, we want to see, we want to see Jesus lifted high. We want to see, we want to see, we want to see Jesus lifted high. Step by step we're moving forward, little by little taking ground. Every prayer, powerful weapon, strongholds come. Jesus lifted high, a banner that flies across this land, that all men might see the truth and know He's the way to heaven. We want to see Jesus lifted high, a banner that flies across this land, that all men might see the truth and know He's the way to heaven. We want to see, we want to see, we want to see Jesus lifted high. We want to see, we want to see, we want to see Jesus lifted high. Step by step we're moving forward, little by little taking ground. Every prayer, powerful weapon, strongholds come. Tumbling down and down and down and down. Woo! We want to see Jesus lifted high. A banner that flies across this land. That all men might see the truth and know He's the way to heaven. Amen. Hey. And God bless you in the Sunday school. Is it any place better than being in the presence of the Lord? Do you desire to be in the presence of the Lord? There you have the fullness of joy. And then you have the, the, the peace that the world doesn't know. Then there we have the freedom. And there we have the love. A love that the world doesn't know. So let's desire to be and welcome the Holy Spirit. To be here with us. And let us be in his presence. Welcome Holy Spirit. Be here with your presence, fill me with your power, live inside of me, welcome Holy Spirit, be here with your presence. Power. Yes, Lord. Lord. 
with your presence. Fill me with your power. Live inside of me. You're the living water. Never drying fountain. Comforter and counselor. Take complete control. Welcome Holy Spirit. We are in your presence. Fill me with your power. Live inside of
heaven to me. Oh, my days on earth I will await the moment that I see you face to face. Nothing in this world will satisfy. Cause Jesus, you're the cup that won't run dry. Nothing in this world will satisfy. Jesus, you're the cup that won't run dry. Jesus, you're the cup that won't run dry. Your presence is heaven to me, Jesus. Your presence is heaven to me. be seated it's, it's time of communion um, when I opened this morning I, I read a passage from one John I uh, started John 10 and I'm going to read just continue reading that for for uh, the communion today it, uh, so it's it's unusual it's not going to be the normal the normal piece that we read with the communion uh, it's John 10 11 to 18 and Jesus talking about himself. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the, for the sheep. The high, hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me, and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of the sheep pen, I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my Father. Yeah, Jesus is predicting his death on the cross. And he says, I give it voluntarily of my own accord. God commanded him to do it. And he did it for each and one, every one of us. When I, when I opened the prayer this morning, the Lord laid it on my heart that people have come here. Some people need encouragement. Others need healing. Other people need a bit of a boost, I was going to use another word, because we may become a bit content and passive with where we are, but he's here to meet each and every one of us this morning. So when we come, it's a, it's a time to remember his death, but also that he's, a, he's risen again, uh, so that we are victorious because of what he has done and the price that he has paid. So I'll open in prayer, and then I'll ask to start at the back row to come forward. I need some assistance. Josephine, can I have, Emmanuel, maybe can you... One other person can come and just help me. Just to, ho I need at least four hands. One more person, a volunteer. Thanks, Tori Brittany. So I'll open in prayer, and then I'll ask you to come from from behind. Father, we just want to thank you, Lord, for this table. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for what it means, Lord, to us. Each one of us, Lord. Each one of us have a need. Each one of us have a desire. Lord, we ask that you meet each and every one of us where we are, Lord. Lord, will you come to us, Lord? You know us. Your word says you know the, the numbers of hair on our heads, Lord. That's how concerned you are about us, Father. 
Lord, so as we come, we remember, Lord, your body, that, uh, the bread symbolizes, Lord, the body that was broken, Lord. Lord, the cup represents, Lord, the blood that was poured out, your, your love that was poured out for us, Lord, so that we might be, Lord, united with you, Lord, that we might have that hope of eternal life. Lord, we thank you for this, Lord. Lord, we also know that your word instructs us to, to before we take the cup, Lord, to, to rem remember that it's, it's, Lord, we're partaking of your body, Lord. We don't want to put you on the cross and crucify you again, Lord. Lord, if there's undealt with sin, Lord, we ask, Lord, that you forgive us. Lord, Father, we ask that each one of us examine our hearts, Lord. Lord, that we become before you, Lord, pure, Lord, because you are a holy and worthy God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I ask Jason at the back row to please just to come forward. Thank you. One single drop of blood is more than enough to cleanse my soul with your love. A little bit of grace can somehow erase a lifetime of failing you. So I sing for you in all that I do. Everything I have is for
Father, we, we are able to give our life to you because, Lord, you first gave your life to us. Lord, you, Lord, bore the shame the, of our iniquities, Lord, on the cross. Amen. Lord, we just remember us as we drink and partake of this cup. Amen. Today's reading is taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 13 to 16. Teaching about salt and light. You are the salt of the earth, but what good is it? What good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Well, I'm continuing my walk through Matthew, and the next part of Matthew is uh, 5, 13, and 16. This basic title would be How to Influence Others. That's, that's really what this passage is talking about. Being a good manager of what God has given us uh, is called stewardship. But if I mention the word stewardship, any, everyone, I guess, starts going here, into the pocket, money. But stewardship isn't about money alone. Uh, Stewardship is far more than cash. One of the main things that we have responsibility to manage, that's to steward for God, is the influence that God has given us. And this passage talks about this. So what's meant by influence? Well, essentially it refers to getting others to follow you or to mirror our lifestyle. Thanks, love. Everybody has influence. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. But what's our influence influence like? You notice he says, you are the salt of the earth. He doesn't say you are the salt of the church. Or you are the salt of your company. Or you are the salt of your family. But you are the salt of the earth. So it's a big job being the salt of the earth. Now, before this morning's message... uh, Just some information about salt. Now, usually the preacher starts to talk to you about New Testament Greek or Old Testament Hebrew. I I thought this morning we'd have a break from that. Okay, so no New Testament Greek, no Old Testament Hebrew. I thought I'd check your Latin. Now, there's there's a very important quote. It comes from a guy, not a Christian, but a great scholar called Pliny. And he, he wrote this. He said, Sine sale, vita humana non potest degere. Isn't that so true? Isn't that right? Sorry? You're sort of lost a bit there. Let, let me, it could be the way I said it too quickly. Okay. Sine sale, vita humana, non potest degere. Okay? Did you catch that? All right. Okay. Okay. Let me translate it. 
Without salt, human life cannot be sustained. That's how critical salt is. Without salt, we die. And without salt, the church dies also. If we are not salt, there will be no more church. There will be no people coming in because there's no salt to flavor the world and to draw them to Christ. Salt is so important. And Jesus uses this imagery purely because of that. Now, let me give you one example of how salt can influence people. Two little examples here. Excuse me this, but it's about mothers, okay? Not fathers. A mother took a young son shopping. Always dangerous, but not as dangerous as taking their daughters. Okay, because that trains the daughters for the husbands to be. Mm. After a day at the stores, a clerk handed the little boy a lollipop. What do you say, the mother said to the boy, to which he replied, just put it on my credit card. Like it or not, that mother had influenced the little boy by all the actions through the day. Now, this is another one, and this does touch dads, okay? Another mother was taking a little boy to school, since the father had to go to work early, and don't we always have to go to work early, we poor fathers. The little boy kept looking around on the way to school. Halfway there, the little boy said, Mum, where are all the idiots? And the mother was sort of puzzled, and she said, What do you mean? Well, said the little boy, Usually, Dad and I see at least three or four idiots on the way to school every day. Whether it's over kids, our co-workers, our family, our friends, we have an influence. The question is, what direction is that influence leading people? There are several leadership principles. Every one of us is a leader in some aspect. The first one is this, if you're writing them down. Make a decision to lead others in the right direction. Principle number one, make a decision to lead others in the right direction. Verse 13, the first part, you are the salt of the earth. One of the remarkable things about salt is that it preserves things. If you salt meat, you know it lasts. Those of you who like codfish, salted, bacalao, you know it lasts a long time. However, if you want to influence others, you have to make a decision as to what kind of influence you're actually going to be. Have you ever noticed that it's easy to be good when you're with people, some people, but it's also easy to be not so good when you're with other people? Have you noticed that? Some people, you never have a problem with jokes. Other people, they start telling coarse jokes and you actually start smiling with them. That's very strange, but that's the problem what we have. You know that some people wouldn't think twice about sharing a joke with you, while others would look at you and they wouldn't even think of even swearing in your presence. We have to be careful. Let me ask, which side are we on? Where are we? What direction have we chosen to influence? Are we being salt in the right place, or are we keeping our salt cellar away from people? How about a general question? Are we influences that prevent decay and rot in others, or do we go along with the worldly flow? And we need to be honest about this. What are we in this world? Second point is get close to those you want to influence. You can't influence somebody from afar. You've got to get close to people. And there's always a risk in getting close to people because if you get close, you have to expose yourself. People get to know the real you and the real me. If we want to influence somebody, we have to get close, and that means they're going to know what we're really like. Salt doesn't do us any good, as I said, sitting in the salt cellar. It's got to be shaken out. It's got to be on the food to make the food taste better. And in the same way, it's difficult to influence people unless we're actually there making contact with them, getting to know them, and really sharing our lives with them. 
You see, when we share our lives, that's the salt coming out. Today, people are saying to the church, especially, don't tell me, show me. It's so true today. Don't preach at me, let me see what's really happening. Don't tell me what you think, show me your life. Don't tell me about Jesus, show me Jesus at work in you. Here's what's so important about influencing others. If you try to tell people what's right, they are not going to listen. But if you get into their lives and show them, they will hear you. Let me say that again. If you try to tell people what's right, they're not going to listen. But if you get into their lives and show them, they're going to hear you. The third point, that's the second half of verse 13. Be a strong Christian. To be an influence, you have to be a strong Christian. The second half of verse 13 says this, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. The starting point for influencing others is not what you do, but who you are. It's not the things you do, because you can do things, and the real you can be hidden. But the reality is, it's who you are. Halfway Christians don't carry the influence that they could do. They end up being influenced by everyone else. If you're not a strong Christian, you are more likely to be influenced by others than influencing others for Christ. A lot of people think they're so strong that they can go into the devil's den and they can win converts. But believe me, that's not true. We consider the devil as being weak at our risk. For us to go into the devil's den is a very dangerous place. When people go out into areas where they need to reach people, they do so with a massive big prayer team at the back of them. We need strength. And not just strength as individuals, but strength from prayer backing. So, if you want to influence family, friends, co-workers, children, you have to start by being the right kind of person yourself. You have to stay close to God. Talk to him. Read and study his word, and especially study his word. And then, obey him in everything. And even when that thing is unpopular. Today, we're in a really bad position as church. Because we have an absolute set of truths and beliefs. And the world doesn't. It's called the postmodern era. The world believes whatever the world wants to believe, and each generation changes it. But the church presents an absolute set of truth. The world looks at us, and we're an anachronism. In fact, in some cases, they say we're downright evil for believing what we believe. So, we are going to be unpopular. But is that strange? Didn't Jesus said, say to us the same thing? He told us there's going to be persecution. He told us, why on earth should they persecute me and then not persecute you? You are going to be persecuted. We are going to be persecuted. And we see that more and more today. Today, more Christians die for their faith than at any point in history. Are we prepared to stand and be unpopular? Here in the West, your lives are not at risk, but your reputation could be. Are you willing to put your reputation on the line? What does it mean, though, for salt to lose its flavor? Have you ever poured salt out and done that? I mean, you know, if it gets wet, does it taste different? No, it doesn't. What does it mean, salt losing flavor? Well, the salt we're talking about here is not the stuff you go and buy in the supermarkets. Okay? It's the stuff that came from the salt sea, the Dead Sea. And they used to harvest it and sell it. But that salt contains large amounts of potash. 
potash. That's potassium chloride. I'm a chemist. That's good, eh? <laughs> so it was, it was salt, yes, good old sodium chloride, but there was potassium chloride, potassium sulfate in there. And what would happen is you'd put it in a container, and if you kept the container nice and dry, you could take it out, and that would be great. It would taste of salt. You could put it on your food. You could salt your meat. Great. But if you were careless and moisture got in, or the dew got in, what would happen is that the sodium chloride would slowly leach away. And if you were really careless over a period of time, you would find that so much of the sodium chloride would disappear, you couldn't actually taste it very much. And then the only thing you could use it for would be as fertilizer. So you would trample it underfoot into the ground to feed your crops. But for you, no flavor, no seasoning. Okay, no, another lesson. Anyone want some information on that? Go on to the internet and look up Arnold Fruchtenbaum. He's a great teacher. Okay, point number four. Realize that your life is on display. As a Christian, you are never not on display. Your TV screen is all, always lit up for people. They have a webcam on you 24-7. Verse 14 says, you are the light of the world. Ouch. Ouch. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Well, we can tell that's absolute truth because when we used to live in Edinburgh, we would drive up towards the village of Varkin. And just above that, on the hillside in the evening, you would see the village of Burden. It would just be lit up, there'd just be this black hillside, and then all of a sudden there'd be this big bright blob, which was, which was that place. And it would just light up. In the daytime, you couldn't see it. But at night time, that light would just shine out and you would see the city on the hill. Couldn't miss it. So what does light do? In that case, it shows the way. In our case, it shows the way to Jesus. To influence others, we have to show the way to go. You know that your life is always on display. If your life is one of a real Christian, you are the glow that lights up the night. And you can't hide that. You light up the way. To Christ. We show them the way, we don't tell them the way. One example, strange one, but it's the only one I could find on this one. A professor was closing his class and he asked the question, are there any further questions? And one student spoke up and he said, yes, professor, what's the meaning of life? And for those of you who read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, it is not 42. Okay, not many of you read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I was just testing you. The professor sat down and he thought for a minute and he said, are you really serious about that question? And the student said, yep, yep. So the professor took a small piece of glass out of his pocket and it was a piece of mirror that had been shaped by scraping uh, into a smooth circle. And he thought for a minute, and he just uh, let the light from the mirror play across the ceiling and then into the faces of the students. And then he said this. He said, I found this when I was a child and scraped it against a rock until I shaped it. I was fascinated with it because I could hold it and reflect light into the deepest corners of a room with it. One day I realized that this was like my life. I decided to spend my life just reflecting the light into as many dark places as I could. Is your life making the darkness deeper or spreading the life? For that professor, that was the meaning of life, to shine light into darkness. And for me, that's the meaning of our lives as Christians, is to shine light into the spiritual darkness of sin. I'm going way too quick. What time are you expecting to close? I've got three more sermons if you want. <laughs> have lots of coffee, okay. Okay, next point is have strong beliefs. And here is the key. And state them boldly. Now, boldly doesn't mean rudely. But boldly means state them and don't apologize. Many Christians state what they believe and apologize. 
well, you, you know, the Bible says this, I'm afraid. Or, well, you know, un unfortunately, that's not what the Bible teaches. Well, that's not how we share. We have to say, the Bible says this. This is the truth of the Bible. Let's not be apologetic. We can be apologists, that's a theological term, but let's not be apologetic for the word of God. Verse 15 says this, nor do they put, sorry, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. So what Jesus is saying here with this verse is this, light was meant to be seen. How silly to turn on a lamp and then put it under something that blocks out the light. You know, you have a nice big light there, and then you take a big container here, and you put it over the top. Well, what's the point of that? You're spending a fortune lighting up the bulb, and you put something on so it no longer shines light. It's, it's pointless. The purpose of light is to light darkness. Isn't it? Yes? No? Anybody awake? I've got three. I've got four more sermons. <laughs> you know, and in the same way, isn't it silly for us to live Christian lives but never make our beliefs known? No. Do people know you're a Christian? You don't have to wear big badges or anything else. The real test is, if you don't wear big badges, do they know you're a Christian? Because of who you are. Because maybe you don't join their jokes. Or maybe when they say something that is particularly rude, you just say, you know, Excuse me, that's not acceptable. No, you, don't, you, don't, you don't have to be narrow-minded, but you have to be straight. But do they know you're a Christian? It's not... Um, sorry. Jesus did say you are the light of the... Sorry, di didn't say you are the light of the church. As I said earlier, he said you're the light of the world, and that has a real meaning for us. It, it's this. It's not just important when you walk through the doors into this church. That light is spread, okay? When we walk through the doors of this church, that's not when our life spreads light. The real key is when we walk back out of that door into the world, that's when our life starts to spread light. Our daughter in the States church has, has, has a great sign on the car park. You know, as you drive in, it says, welcome to First Baptist Church. You park your car. That's great. Service is over. You drive out. And the same sign on the back says, you are now entering the mission field. It's a great reminder, isn't it? Maybe we should have a little door on that, a little sign on there. But it's true. We walk into church, and I really feel this, this is where we get powered up. We get the fellowship, we get the word of God, we get worship, we get a connection with Jesus. But when we go th back through that door, that is when we've entered the mission field. And that's where our lives need to spread light. This part isn't very pleasant though at times, is it? You know, when you go back with friends and they're planning something contrary to your Christian faith, do we have strong beliefs to be able to say, no, sorry guys, not going to do it. Or, do you realize what you're doing? Or do we just go along with it? We, you know, we've got to stop. Because especially if you've got kids, your kids will be a complete reflection of you. If you're a person of compromise, your kids will see that. The smaller the child, the more intellectual they are in these areas. They are incredibly clever. I don't know why they call it the terrible twos, but I think it's because at two, they really start to see the truth. It's not the terrible twos, it's the truthful twos. What are people doing with the light of their lives? Hiding it? Or is it a part of what we are everywhere we go? Let's think about that. Let's pray about that. And the last part, last leadership principle is this, make everything we do work for the glory of God. Make everything we do work for the glory of God. Verse 16, let your light so shine before men 
that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You notice it doesn't say anything about preaching. It doesn't say anything else there about doing good deeds. It says quite simply, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. The light has to come, you know, principally at the beginning. We can do great works. We should do good works. That's the whole point of the church. We're there to do good works. But anybody can do good works. They should know why we're doing good works in order to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Let our light so shine before men. That word so is important. Not just let your light shine, but let your light so shine before men. There's an urgency in this word from Jesus. The end result is not so they'll think we're good. The end result is they will look at us and say, wow, God has made a difference in this person's life. I want to know more. You see, the whole point is we're pushing the glory this way, aren't we? Yes? No? I think several people are drifting. Okay, that's six sermons. You've got, you've got at least half an hour. I, I can get some good ones in now, including New Testament Greek and Old Testament Hebrew. You know, as the... Uh, oh, that's a good one. I wasn't going to put this in. I will, actually. We've got just a few seconds. Does anybody remember the time, this is good aging, of the uh, Cultural Revolution in China, seeing it on the news? Anybody old enough to remember that? Sorry, anybody young enough to remember that? Time of the Cultural Revolution was pretty horrific, and especially for the church in China. Uh, it, it was a point where pastors were just rounded up and shot. It was a point where anybody with any faith was rounded up and either put in prison camps or just blown away. It, it, was, a, it was a horrific time. Even members of the Communist Party, if they favored the Russian version of communism, were put in camps and either disappeared or spent many years there. It was a horrible time. But during this period, the communist state of China commissioned an author to write a biography about Hudson Taylor. Now, has anybody heard of Hudson Taylor? Chris's hero, okay? Fantastic missionary way back in China. He was the guy that introduced the principle of the missionary wearing local clothing and living with the local people so that they could see the reality of Jesus where they were. So this man was regarded by the, by the, by the Christians in China as, as a real saint. You know, he was a tremendous, powerful man of God. So the government in China commissioned an author to write a biography with the sole purpose of distorting the facts and presenting Hudson Taylor as an evil, miserable, horrible Westerner capitalist. Someone sent to ensnare the poor Chinese people. They wanted to discredit his name of a person we would say is a consecrated missionary of the gospel. And the, that's what, what the local Chinese would say as well. But as this author was doing his research, and obviously he was a, you know, a bright guy, he was increasingly impressed by Taylor's character by what he read. Because he didn't just read books. He would interview people who had known him. He would interview people who, who had relatives who had known him. He even went into prison camps to talk to people. So he actually did a, a fantastic amount of research. And um, he was so impressed by this man's character, his godly life, that he found it extremely difficult to actually do the job he was being paid to do. And... What did he do? Now remember, this is the time of the Cultural Revolution. Eventually, this person, non-Christian, member of the Communist Party, at the risk of losing his own life, laid aside his pen, he renounced his atheism, and he received Jesus as his personal saviour. Why? Because the light of Jesus shone through the character of a man who had been dead for about a century. That light was still there. 
And that light led this man to salvation. Hudson Taylor led a man to Jesus many years after his death. Hopefully we can do that while we're still alive. But make everything work for the glory of God. Now, hopefully we've got some scientists and engineers and possibly even accountants in the house. I've got a nice formula for you, okay? This is the conclusion, so it means coffee is in, in about five minutes, okay? Here's a simple formula to describe everything that I've spoken. You probably say, why don't you just give us the formula and we, we could have had coffee earlier. Well, you're going to have to sit through the rest, okay? This is the formula. High potency plus close proximity equals high impact. Is that good? High potency plus close proximity equals high impact. Okay, what's high potency? First of all, it can be strong salt. What is strong salt? It's a life that is really surrendered to God. It's having strong beliefs and being willing to state them. It's living a life that is always doing the right thing on display. That's a life of high potency. Strong salt. A life that surrendered fully to God. A person with strong beliefs that is willing to state them. And a life that's always doing the right thing on display. So high potency. Now we have to add that to close proximity. Close proximity is a willingness to get close to people and into their lives. Not just to say, hi, how are you, and just walk past. But hi, how are you? And spend time with them. And an attitude that also says, watch me and I'll show you Jesus at work in me. Watch me. Show you Jesus at work in me. And if we add those two characteristics together, it produces high impact, which is people who will follow you in the right direction, people who will want what you have got, and finally, that you will have a tremendous impact for Christ. People who will follow you in the right direction, people who will want what you've got, and you will have a tremendous impact for Christ himself. That is how we can have influence over people. That's how we can be salt and light. It's not simple. It's costly. But Jesus didn't call us to have a free run. He said, we're going to be disciples. And if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. This life is not easy for us, but at the end of it, there is a tremendous treasure in store. We're not called to have a jolly in this life. We're called to serve, to be servants. Yes, there will be blessings, but there will also be times of trial and difficulties. But Christ has warned us about this, but what did he say? When they come, he will be with us. Lo, I will be with you always, unto the end of the age. Are we willing to serve our Lord and Savior? You know, this symbol here is so important. A man who had never sinned gave up his life. Yet he wasn't just a man, was he? God and man who committed no sin, came to this earth and gave up his life in our stead. While we were yet enemies, yet he came to save us. Are we willing to be his servants and to serve him in this world? You know, one of the things we can do as Christians is aim to be in heaven at the end of this life, but have a great time taking as many people with us as we possibly can. 
That's the challenge this morning. Are you salt stuck in a salt shaker? Do you want to be let out? God can do that. We don't have to be an evangelist to let our salt savor those around us. God didn't call everybody to be an evangelist, but he called us all to be witnesses. And the greatest form of witness is to let them see Christ in us as we live our lives daily. But you know, if you've got kids, check it out first with them. The small ones. They'll really see the reality. Remember the story of where are the idiots? And if you're driving your kids to school, remember that story. You might be asked one day, Mom, why don't we see any idiots this morning? What do you mean? Well, Dad sees three or four every day. Oops. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you called us to be salt and light. And that we, Lord, confess that there's no possibility that we can do this in our own strength, in our own means. Father, we ask this morning for a fresh infilling of your Holy Spirit to touch us and to allow us to recognize and realize that as we draw close to you, as we feed on your word, as we seek to obey you, then, Lord, we do indeed become that salt and light. Thank you for the call you've put on our lives. Thank you that you saved us from the power of sin. Thank you for your death on the cross. But thank you more for your resurrection. And the truth that even now you are seated at the right hand of Father. Help us, Lord, each one of us, to become light and salt witnesses to those around us. And as we go back through the doors of this church building, Father, let us become light that shines out into the dark places. Where, Lord, we feel weak, we pray that your Holy Spirit will replace that weakness with strength. And where, Lord, we have a lack of understanding of your word, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will just turn us to the word and allow the word to feed us and to build up that storehouse of truths. Thank you, Lord, for your wondrous gift to us. We just offer ourselves to you afresh as your servants, as we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And now may the grace of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest and remain with each one of us, now and evermore. Amen. Amen. And we wish to say goodbye to you all because this is our last Sunday here now until September the 15th. So while the cat's away, please do not become mice. <laughs>